and I will explain coming up at 11.15. But right now, it is a pleasure to be joined by the one, the only, Chris Biederman. Check out his Candlestick Chronicles podcast, Talking Niners, for at Blue Wire Pods. Follow him on Twitter, at Chris Biederman. Chris, how are you? I'm outstanding. How are you guys? Good. Good. Outstanding. Good to Love to hear that. Outstanding. <laughs> No complaints over here, Chris, but I think some Niners fans have some complaints, so let's start there. Did you have a problem with either or or both of the calls, both the personal foul call and also the non-fumble call? Yeah, you know, I thought the non-fumble call was worse, particularly because, I mean, I went back and looked, and and I thought it was pretty clear that uh, the ball actually went backwards. So whether or not you thought it was a pass and it was initially ruled a pass, if it goes backwards, it is a fumble. And officials have been instructed to uh, allow those plays to go on instead of whistling them dead, uh, which ultimately changed the way that they they had to approach that replay, right? So if they initially called that a fumble, which is what they're trained to do in close situations like that, then they go back and review it. There's a better chance that it, that it goes the Niners way. Um, but I just didn't think, you know, in slow motion, maybe you can make the case that it looked like a pass, but I, I didn't see any way that, that you could actually consider that uh, a pass. I thought the personal foul on Gibson while replays showed it was shoulder to shoulder. There's such a point of emphasis for referees to protect defenseless receivers and player safety and all that, that um, I understand why they called the, why they threw the flag initially. I, I think if, if I were to quibble with just the overall situation, I would say, you know, in the fourth quarter of games, you should make, you should make those calls reviewable, right? Throw the flag initially and if replays show that it was shoulder to shoulder uh, like it was, then you then you rescind the flag and, and it's OK. And, and, you know, the NFL, I think, generally has a problem with too many replays and games taking too long. But when there are calls like that that ultimately have huge impacts on the outcomes of games, um, I think they should be allowed to uh, go under the hood and, and check the replay in that one. But to me, the more egregious call was the end of half uh, non fumble. I just didn't see any way that you could actually rule that as a incomplete pass and the only way it was was because they ruled that initially because you you know you need absolute unequivocal proof to overturn a call on the field and and you can't get that in a bang bang play like that uh chris coming into uh sunday's game jake moody was was perfect on the year with the exception of, of preseason but uh how, how concerned are you after he missed two kicks you know one earlier in the game and then of course the the final kick of the day and also you know they they weren't weren't especially difficult you know in terms of distance they weren't incredibly difficult kicks so how how concerned are you about moody or is this something that we need to monitor if if he is in a situation where he has to take another big kick yeah, you know, it's going to be interesting. We're going to learn a lot about his resolve and just how, mm -hmm. how mentally tough he is. Um, and, and the 49ers said they liked his makeup and, and his mental toughness and, you know, everything they were able to glean about him before the draft. But there isn't really any substitute for kicking in the NFL, particularly kicking in high pressure situations when you have a team with Super Bowl aspirations and expectations that's depending on a 23 year old kicker. So, um, you know, it, it, he had that Raiders game in the preseason. He had a two way miss going. Uh, he had the two two way miss go yesterday or Sunday. Uh, and so, you know, that that's that, that that is problematic, obviously. Now, if he bounces back and he has another game winning kick coming up and, and he drills it, then you probably feel a lot better. But mm -hmm. if he misses another one, then you start to to have the conversation of, you know, how long is the leash here? If he misses another kick like that and the team, you know, loses a game uh, on on basically on on Jake Moody's right foot then you're going to have, you know, there are going to be a lot of conversations about do they have to go another direction? Do they go call Robbie Gold, who is currently unemployed and, and a free agent? We don't know if he's been kicking uh, or if he's in shape. Right. And, and obviously there's an element of, you know, kickoffs aren't going to be as good if Robbie Gold's your kicker. Um, and Mitch Wisnowski, the punter, hasn't been particularly good at kickoffs when, when he's had to do it either. Um, so if he misses another one, then, yeah, it's really problematic. If he makes his next one, then you're like, OK, he missed his first one. Uh, hopefully he has a long career. Uh, hopefully it's a, it's a learning experience and it's just something he can bounce back from. And if not, then, you know, you do not want a season where the 49ers are historically good and arguably as good as they've been since 1994 derailed by a kicker you draft in the third round. That that's, that's probably the worst case scenario. Yep. Chris Biederman joins us. Check out his podcast, The Candlestick Chronicles. Follow him at Chris Biederman. Chris Watkins, Zachariah, Sacktown Sports, 1140. Chris, when it comes to Brock Purdy's performance, 
do you put the majority, if you were to split it up into a, a pie, if you will, do you put it on the conditions? Do you put it on the fact that he was down his two top weapons in Debo and CMC? Was it just a matter of him having an off game? Was it the Browns defense? Where do you go with how poor he looked? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> all, all, all the okay. above. Uh, I think it, it. I think it was you know a confluence of factors. Purdy obviously wasn't sharp, um, and it's and, and it's harder to have good games against great defenses, um, and particularly when the defenses are, are dominating your offensive line, which the Browns dominated the 49ers offensive front. Even Trent Williams, particularly after he injured his ankle, uh, wasn't very good in that game against Miles Garrett. And you know Miles Garrett's one of the one of the best pass rushers in the NFL. So it, it becomes exceedingly difficult. Throw in the fact that you have rainy conditions um, and a sloppy field and you're missing two of your top weapons, then it's going to be, it's going to be super difficult. But, you know, we knew Brock Purdy wasn't going to win every single start he made, right? Like he, he had been undefeated to this point. The Niners had won 15 straight regular season games. And I don't think anybody thought the 49ers were going to go 17 and 0 this year. So, you know, it's it's one of those games, uh, at least Monday night is going to be one of those games where we'll have an opportunity to learn a lot about Brock Purdy and his resolve. Right. We talk about Jake Moody and is he going to be able to bounce back? We, I think we could say the same thing about Brock Purdy and that, you know, if he bounces back and has a really strong game and is decisive and accurate and the ball's not slipping out of his hands, obviously it's going to be indoors and the weather isn't going to be an issue Monday night in Minnesota. Then you start to feel, OK, Brock Birdie is is more the guy we saw in the first five weeks of the season and, and his five starts last year than what we saw in Cleveland. So it's it's I think we're probably going to learn more about Brock Purdy Monday night than than we have to this point, because it's been pretty smooth sailing. He hasn't had to deal with injuries to his skill guys offensively. He's played behind, you know, a, a, an offensive line that that hasn't really gotten whooped like it got whooped on Sunday. Um, so if the 49ers control the line of scrimmage, if. Um, you know, I mean, I, I just think it's it's an opportunity to to figure out, OK, can Brock Purdy bounce back or is this is this going to start like a slide? I don't think it will. But, you know, like so, sometimes a, a game like that can cause some guys to lose confidence and, and we'll figure out if Brock Purdy is going to lose that confidence or if he's going to bounce back. And if he bounces back, obviously, I think that's a really good sign because every quarterback in the NFL can can, you know, has a bad game now and then. It's just can you bounce back? Can you limit how few? of those bad games you have and and can you you know continue to get on on back on pace to where the 49ers were before Sunday's game in Cleveland. Chris, what did you think about uh, Randy Gregory's performance on Sunday in his first first action with the Niners? I believe he recorded a sack, but uh mm -hmm. just what what did you think about his performance and uh how they utilized him and how you think they'll utilize him more in the future? Yeah, you know, I thought it was it was encouraging from that perspective, given that, you know, he was a guy who had basically two practices under his belt with the team and he came and he had a third down sack and they played him a pretty good amount. Um, and you look at the production they've gotten opposite Nick Bosa at defensive end and, and they could use an, an infusion of production there. They haven't, you know, since week one, they haven't really gotten anything from Jake Jackson and Cleveland Farrell, while a solid player, particularly against the run, is, is not a dominant type pass rusher that, that they're going to need on those critical third down situations. So getting somebody with a high end talent like Randy Gregory could potentially be really beneficial. And, you know, I think how much they played him, I don't have the snap count uh, off the top of my head, but how much they played him would indicate to me, they feel really good about the talent that they have about how easily he was able to acclimate. And, you know, really Chris Kasurik is, you know, I think unquestionably one of the best defensive line coaches in the league. So you give him a talented piece to play opposite Nick Bosa and next to Eric Armstead and Javon Hargrave. Like that's that's a pretty optimal situation to be in. So I would expect I would expect Gregory to get more and more playing time uh, as time goes on, particularly in passing situations. And and I think you have to be encouraged by what you saw on Sunday. Chris and I have been joking that the Niners seem to be the best team in the league, yet have the smallest cap uh, space hit and have the most cap room. If you were to choose between <laughs> possibly some run defense help as it looked like, you know, the Browns were able to run pretty comfortably last week or offensive line help. Which way would you go? I would go offensive line help. I, I think Spencer Burford and, you know, has, has it's been a struggle for him. I, I, you know, I still need to see more from Colton McKivitz over a full season to feel really confident about the right tackle situation. Look, the 49ers, especially when they've had Drake Greenlaw in the lineup, who, who was a sneaky big absent uh, absence on Sunday, um, they've been, you know, one of the best run defenses in the league. So I'm not super concerned about that. I would be more concerned with interior, 
interior uh allowing interior pressure like that you look at the nfc championship game against the rams you look at the super bowl against the chiefs the fourth quarter of those games the niners interior of the offensive line has gotten dominated by some really good players and ultimately that's been a huge factor in them not winning those games so um that that will always be until until we see those guys dominate or play at a really high levels in in those big pressure moments um i'm gonna feel like the offensive line is probably the achilles heel of the team and, um, you know, the Eagles are, are going to provide a similar challenge if, if everybody's healthy. Jalen Carter has been one of the best defensive linemen in the league. And I think he's unquestionably going to be the defensive rookie of the year for the Eagles. And so, um, you know, he's going to he, he has the potential to dominate in the same way that, that the Browns did on Sunday. So I think when you look forward and try to spin it forward into, you know, what do we know about the 49ers going as the weeks go on? It's going to be, man, can the interior hold up against some of these elite interior pass rushers? Um, because ultimately that's been that's been a real cause for their downfalls in some of these big games in the playoffs. And and for now, it doesn't seem like that issue is solved just yet. Chris, I'm, before we get you out of here, I just want to know how you would approach the uh, the 49ers injury woes that they they kind of fell on this weekend. Obviously, McCaffrey the, with more so with the with the bigger names, McCaffrey, Trent Williams, Debo Samuel. And also, if, if you have I haven't seen any update on Diamador Lenore, who also uh, went down on Sunday. Just how would you approach uh, with their their game being on Monday and might even having a, a shorter week of recovery on the back end? Yeah, you know, I, I think the 49ers, even if it's Elijah Mitchell instead of Christian McCaffrey, and and even if it's, you know, Jawan Jennings or Ray Ray McLeod getting more time instead of Debo Samuel, I, I would I would be fine if I'm Kyle Shanahan and saying, look, we we have we have a little bit of depth here. We don't have to rush our guys back. This isn't a do or die situation against the Vikings, who obviously aren't, you know, a, a cream of the crop team in the NFL, or at least they haven't mm. proven to be that this year. Um, so I, I would be cautious. I, I think, you know, in a 17 week season. Um, you, you want to have your guys for the long haul and you don't, I don't, I just don't think you necessarily have to risk it because, you know, Elijah Mitchell, who's, who's barely been used this season. Um, I know he's coming off a knee injury, but he's somebody who looked like an upper echelon running back when he's been healthy the last few years. So I think you can ride with him and you can alter your game plan a little bit to survive without Christian McCaffrey. Um, Trent Williams, you know, it's going to be, it's, it's an ankle issue. Obviously that's problematic. It's turf. Uh, on Monday night, you got Daniel Hunter with the Vikings, who's who's a really good edge rusher. Um, you know, obviously you'd love to have Trent Williams, but I, you know, you think about the NFC Championship game against the Rams, and he played, and and he was, uh, you know, really a a a, a shell of himself in that game. I would argue, you know, I, he even said later, uh, I think a season later, in hindsight, that he kind of wished he didn't play in that game because the 49ers might have had a better chance with a healthier player in that spot, mm -hmm. as good as Trent Williams is. So, you know, you don't want to play him and rush him back too soon and have him aggregate that ag aggravate that injury, not aggregate it. <laughs> and then uh, and then be worse going forward. You, you know, I, I think the 49ers, given that it's the Vikings um, and given that they have their buy in a couple weeks, would be wise to rest their guys because I do think they can win without them. And that's you know, that's part of having one of the best rosters in the league is that you can survive some injuries. Right. You just don't want to make them worse. Do yourself a favor and check out Candlestick Chronicles podcast. Chris Biederman, follow him at that name. Chris, always appreciate the time. Enjoy your Tuesday. No problem. Thank you guys for having me. See you, Chris. There you See go, you. Chris Biederman. Good stuff there. So stuff. he thought the non-fumble call more egregious than the personal yeah. foul call. But That's, he basically yeah. said exactly what we said, mm -hmm. that the fumble call shouldn't have been blown dead right. and that the personal foul call should have been reviewed. Yeah. I mean, and could, I didn't even think to see if the pass was backwards too. I mean, cause that's, that's just the end all be all. If it's yeah. a backwards pass, it doesn't matter if it's a fumble or if well, it's a pass, if it's backwards, it's backwards. But it's fumble. But technically if you're, if no, you're, if you throw the ball behind, behind yourself, but not if you're throwing forward. No, but he threw it backwards is what he's saying. Oh, okay. If he threw the ball, because he was being sacked and turned to the side. But he, it can go backwards if you're going yeah, forward, though. No. no. If, if the ball goes backwards when you throw the ball, it's a fumble. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, if you try and if you try and set up, like, a double pass to yeah. where quarterback snaps, throws it to a receiver. I know that, yeah. That's a fumble yeah, if yeah. he doesn't but catch it. But if you're it. forced, like, no, if you're trying matter. to go forward and it go, mm -mm. gets forced back? Nope. Okay. Nope. If well, then that makes pass. it even more egregious. Yep, exactly. There you go.